So we are covering the emotion and motivation sections today and the test number four, which covered uh, sensation, perception, thinking, and intelligence, that was due on Sunday. And the personality, when we get to personality next week, we'll have test number five, which will cover the motivation and health and stress and emotion, motivation, emotion, and health and stress chapter. And then we'll have a little while before we get to test number six. And then the final. So we're coming up on the ending here. Everybody, I think, I believe, and I think that's about it for my announcements for today. So let's go back to where we were in emotion and motivation. We're talking about emotions. All right. So this is where we ended last time. And we're talking about the different mechanisms of the brain that cause or are related to emotions and how they work. So we talked about the limbic system is the main area where the brain has emotions starting and we have, we have the reticular formation which tells the brain that there's information coming to the brain that activates the brain. And remember we talked about the people who have narcolepsy, their reticular activation system just shuts down for no reason. So it's actually the stimulation of the brain, that particular area of the brain. The cortex is involved in interpreting events, so any kind of emotion that is related to thinking process is going to be a part of the cortex. The right hemisphere specializes in negative emotions like anger and depression, and the left hemisphere specializes in positive emotions like happiness, and this is called the lateralization of emotions. And remember, if you're missing a, a lobe of the brain, if, if, if you have only half of a brain, which some people are born with only half a brain, but as children, the part that's left over takes over everything. So the brain can change its function as a child, but as an adult, if you lose part of your brain, you're going to lose that positive emotions or negative emotions, and the other side of the brain will not be able to take over. It has already set itself, like hot plastic has started to cool off. By the time you're 21, it's pretty cold and you're not going to be able to change much in the way that the brain behaves. The thalamus brain relay station has connections to every place in the brain uh, and it plays a role in stimulating the fear response before we're even consciously aware of the threat that's out there for us. So our eyes see something. We're not sure yet what they saw because it hasn't even activated the occipital lobe as the electrical signals are going from your eyes to the back of your brain, they also go through the thalamus, and the thalamus sends out information to the rest of the brain. And this is a split second. I mean, we're not talking about a whole big time frame here, but you will be reacting to that thing your eyes saw before you even know what it is that you saw. So the association cortex has not even been activated yet, but you are already reacting to whatever it was your eyes see. So these connections are probably not built into the system, but they come from operant classical conditioning and the plasticity of the brain as a child. The autonomic nervous system is, for, uh, is broken up into two different parts. Remember the parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems. And the pleasant stimulations will activate the parasympathetic nervous system while unpleasant stimulations and things that make you want to fight, flight, or freeze will activate the sympathetic nervous system, which prepares the body for dangerous situations. Hormones are secreted into the blood when you have a reaction, an emotional reaction. Serotonin is involved in depression. We've already talked about that in the biological section. Uh, serotonin has a long gene and a short gene, and people with long genes are less susceptible to depression than people with short genes are. The adrenaline uh, that is released into your system is part of your fear response, and noradrenaline that is released into your system is part of the anger response. And once you have these particular hormones flowing through your system, you will have the 
behavioral mechanisms associated with those particular emotions even after the emotion has died away because the hormone itself has to be metabolized before it can be released from the body. So hormones are released to affect the body's systems and once they're in the, in the blood, they have to be metabolized before they stop acting on the system. And metabolization takes a much longer time to, and, and affects the body much longer than a single instance of a neuron firing off at one one thousandth of a second. Steroids are a type of hormone that are made by man. I get steroids every once in a while because of my uh, reaction to poison ivy. They give me prednisone. Prednisone is a steroid. And there are people who are shot with steroids in order to muscle up. And when I was playing baseball, I had bursitis. And so I had steroids put into my shoulder to stop the bursitis in both shoulders, actually. And steroids are great in short, short amounts. They, they relieve uh, your tension, they relieve your pain, and they give a sense of relief of, to the whole body. But with continued use, they increase your metabolism. So you're running at a much higher metabolism than normal. And they, continue, and they lead to anger. So something that would not normally have made you go off will make you go off if you're on steroids. Uh, and the things that you would be able to hold to control, you lose control of. And you get, if you continue to use steroids for a long period of time, you will go into rage very rapidly. You'll just skip all the pieces before that and go right into rage. It can also create depression as well. If you see a sports person who's continuously getting in trouble with the law because they get angry and they do something stupid, they're on steroids. There's no question. They're being, they're, no matter what they say about themselves, and sports people love to take steroids because it does bulk them up and gives them a better response time oxygen-wise. They can use less oxygen, so they are able to keep up their stamina for a longer period of time. But they also are doing major damage to their body because steroids, as I said, they increase your metabolism level, and that means stress on the body. And stress will kill you, and that's why the next section that we talk about is stress because it's very important. You have to know how to manage your stress. So continuous arousal, which is stress, is harmful to your health over the long term. There are two major theories about how we acquire our emotions or how they are triggered. We know how we acquire them. We're human beings and we have emotion. But how are they triggered? Uh, James Lang, and this is William James, the William James, the first true American psychologist, and Lang, uh, they had a theory of emotion that's very similar to the two-factor theory, which is the other theory. And they said an emotion-provoking stimulus produces a physical response first. The physical response occurs first. Then it produces the emotion. So first we cry, then we feel sorry, or first we tremble, and then we feel angry. Now this was before the days of the classical conditioning and opera conditioning behaviorists and so they didn't have any idea what classical and operant conditioning was. And classical conditioning, I think, is a good indication of how this can happen. Because as children, we cry when we're sad. We're sad, and then we cry, which connects sadness and crying together. So later in life as adults, if we cry, it triggers the sadness area. So that's very possibly why this is the truth, why this works the way it does, because we tend to think that we have a, an emotion first, and then we have the behavioral response. But they're saying it's the opposite. It's behavioral response first. So the two-factor theory is very similar to it. Let's look at a picture of the two of them, and we'll see. So the James Lang theory says you see a snake, you have an adrenaline release, and then you feel fear. So there is a physical response before the emotion occurs. In the two-factor theory, 
it's very similar, the stimulus, the response, the emotion, but they also include in there the cognitive appraisal of I'm seeing a snake, whoops, I'm seeing a snake and I'm afraid of snakes or snakes are dangerous and uh, they've killed people I know or put people in the hospital so your memory systems are activated and so you got the stimulus, the physical arousal, the adrenaline is being released, you are then aware of what it is and then you have the emotion. I think this is much more reasonable than the James Lang theory, but I, think, I still think it should be a straight line as in stimulus, cognitive appraisal, physical arousal, and emotion. But like I said, the, the thalamus can be activating all kinds of areas of your brain before you even know what it is that you're seeing. So it is possible to have the adrenaline release before you actually know what it is you're looking at. Although uh, emotional responses are, are not are not always consciously regulated, they can be, and you should learn to control them. You should, your emotional responses are important, and you should know what is a proper emotional response for a particular situation instead of, instead of having an unconscious reaction to it. So for instance, if a waitress spills a cup of coffee on you, not not steaming hot coffee so that you're burned, but just spills anything on you. So you're at, the, you're at lunch with your friends and a, and a waitress spills something on, on you. There are lots of different ways to respond to that. You can just be you know, practical about it and say, uh, let your boss know I'm gonna be sending them the bill for the dry cleaning for this shirt or this, this dress. Right? Or you can joke about it. Just, you know, had a bad day, huh? <laughs> you know. Uh, you can ignore it completely. Just brush it off and just keep on going. Or you can scream and holler, jump up and down, and threaten to have her fired. And there's all kinds of emotional responses that you can have to this particular situation. It is up to you how you respond to that. You are in control of your emotions. You should be in control of your emotions. But let me give you, um, because we're about to get into the stress chapter next, let me give you a different response to this. You wake up from sleep and realize, oh my God, the alarm clock didn't go off and I'm going to be late for work. So you really hurry, hurry, hurry to get ready to go to work, but you know you're going to be late. You get downstairs and the dog that you have couldn't wait for you. You usually let him out a lot earlier and so there's a big pile of steaming in, on the rug you have to clean up. And then you go outside and the car has a flat tire. Now, how are you going to get to work? You know, you're, going to get to, you're going to have to call a friend, hopefully, who hasn't gotten to work yet, or call a taxi, or fix the tire yourself, and then get to work, and you're going to be late. There's no question you're going to be tremendously late now, and you get to work, and the boss is all over you about being late. I know I'm late. You don't, you don't tell the boss this, obviously. You're thinking in your head, I know I'm late. I'm always on time. I've already had a bad day. I don't need you jumping on top of me to tell me something I already know. And then you go to lunch with your friends, and the waitress spills something on you. You're going to jump up and down, scream and holler, and, have her try and threaten to have her fired because all of that pressure has built up and she has just given you an excuse for getting rid of all that pressure that is built up in you. And we'll talk about that in the stress chapter. But yeah, that happens often. It is not her fault for everything or his fault for everything that happened to you previously. And it is a mistake and it is wrong to blame them for everything that has happened to you previously that day. But we do that and we'll talk about that in the stress chapter. So why do we attempt to control our emotions? And this is part of your essay at the end of the class, your cultural essay, because there are display rules per culture. So permissible ways of displaying emotions in a particular society, and some societies teach to hide your emotions and others teach to display them. Asian collectivist cultures do not show anger or happiness in public. You would, you would never be joyful in public or angry in public in Tokyo. But 
in New York, not a problem. You see people all the time who are emotional in public all the time. So in our individualistic society, it is okay to show emotions. In a collectivist society, it is not. And that is a just display rules. It's just the rules of that particular culture or society. And the emotional intelligence is your ability to know your own emotions and know, know your and be able to control them. So it's the ability to understand and control emotional responses. And some people have a high emotional intelligence and some people not at all. And we'll talk about people who have anger in issues who don't even recognize when they're getting angry. So some do a better job than others at controlling their emotions. And one experiment that was done called the Goldman Marshmallow Experiments was a really interesting experiment that was based on delayed gratification, the ability to gratify yourself, right? I, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. Well, you know, it's not really lunchtime, so I'm just going to wait and I'll eat at lunch rather than grabbing something. Or at the grocery store, they have all the candy bars right there at the cash register because they know people have a hard time delaying their gratification. Ooh, a candy bar. Grab it, put it on the and buy the candy right there. So delaying of gratification. This particular experiment was done with numerous types of candy for various children at um, young ages, five, six years of age. And these children um, were talked to first to find out what their favorite candy was. And then a scientist came in, the researcher came in with a handful of their favorite candies. Now, this particular experiment is called the marshmallow experiment because the person, the little child who they filmed liked marshmallows, and so he had come in with a whole bunch of marshmallows. But it could be anything. It's not just marshmallows. So this particular child likes marshmallows. This researcher comes in with a handful of marshmallows and says, let's count the marshmallows. He pulls one marshmallow out, puts it on the table. What's that? The child says, one. Yes, exactly. One. Good. And then he pulls out the second one. What's, not, what's this one? Number two. Yes, good. Puts it down on the table. As soon as it hits the table, the door bursts open, and the person it, that helps them yells, doctor, doctor, there's an emergency. You have to come and take the telephone. You've got to call this. You talk to this person on the phone. The, the guy, researcher goes, okay, I'll be right there, and says to the child, these two marshmallows, I have a whole handful more. I'm going to be gone for just a little while. If you don't eat those marshmallows on the table, then you can have all these marshmallows when I come back. But if you eat those marshmallows, you can't have any of these marshmallows. And he leaves the room. And some of the children go, you know, they just sit there. They have perfect delay of gratification. No problem whatsoever. They just sit there. Okay, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> they don't care. Other children have the ability to delay their gratification, but it is difficult for them. They're like looking at the, and they're touching the marshmallows. Oh, it's like, oh, it tastes so good. Oh. And they're banging their heads on the desk. When you watch these movies, they're banging their heads on the desk. They turn their back to the marshmallows so they don't have to look at it, but they delay their gratification. There's other children, that door does not even click close or they're gone. No delay of gratification whatsoever, cannot delay their gratification. They follow these children now. They are now two groups, those who can delay their gratification, those who cannot delay their gratification, and they follow these children throughout their life to see if there's any difference between these two groups. And it turns out there is a big difference between the two groups. Those who could delay their gratification showed higher SAT scores and PSAT scores to get into college and to get to their master's and PhD levels. And they had less stress in their life when they were told you know, to fill out surveys. They showed less stress than the normal population and they had less frustration in their life, and they had more self-reliance. They were able to rely on themselves more than 
people outside and who could not delay their gratification. Those who could not delay their gratification had lots more stress, much more frustration, and lots more self-reliance problems, not being able to trust themselves. And <clears throat> this experiment should have been done a little bit differently. First of all, there's new experiments that have been done to show that there's more variables involved. Those who could not delay their gratification may be able to delay their gratification, but don't trust the scientists to actually give them because they've been told all their lives, well, you're going to get this and then they never get it. So they don't trust adults. And so if they don't trust the, the, the scientists about getting the rest of them, then why not eat what you have then? So there's some variables in there that they did not test in the original. But there's also something they should have done. They should have taken the group that could not delay their gratification and split them up. And one group, they should have taught delayed gratification to that group to see if you can teach delayed gratification. Or is it just something that's built into our system? It's a spectrum and you can't change it. We have no idea because they did not do that experiment. As far as I know, no one's ever done that experiment to find children and who cannot delay their gratification and teach them. Because we do. We teach our children delay gratification. I want dessert. You can have dessert after you finish your meal. Um, I want that. You're driving. You're, you're pushing a cart down the aisles in the grocery store. Your child's in the, in the seat. And they're like, I want that. I want that. And you're like, you can have it after we get out of the store. Right? We'll buy it for you, but you can't eat it right now. You can eat it when we get out of the store, or you can eat it after dinner. Right? We, we, we talk about delay of gratification all the time, although we don't make it an obvious, this is delay of gratification. You need to learn how to wait, and we don't teach children that. If we could teach, if we did take a group and taught them that, would it work to improve their SAT scores, their, their self-reliance, less frustration, less stress in their life? No one's ever done the experiment, as far as I can tell. And then there are people who lie to us, and there are clues that we pick up, emotional clues about them lying to us. But there are some of these clues that are completely ridiculous, and the FBI has actually done studies on them to tell because they need to know if somebody's lying or not. And so if you have dilated pupils, that person's lying. But you have to be right up on top of somebody to see their pupils. And if they are blue-eyed, you can see them real well. If there are dark eyes, you can't see the pupil very well. So you have to be really close. And most people who are lying to you are not right in your face lying to you. And then there are long pauses in speech. Well, if you know the person's normal speech pattern, then you can tell if it's a long pause or not. But they might already have longer pauses than you might no consider normal, so they might not be ly lying to you just because they have a longer pause than you're used to. So really, this is how you tell if your friends are lying to you because <laughs> you know their speech pattern, and if they are pausing, then you know that they're lying to you. There are other body cues, nervousness in their body postures, and reduced eye blinking. And the averted eye is something that people have talked about for many years. If you're looking up and to the right, you're looking at one thing. You're thinking about one thing. If you're looking up and to the left, you're looking at a different thing. And if you're looking down and to the right and left, you're thinking completely different things. And one of them is supposedly associated with lying. And the FBI has proven that is completely and utterly false. It has nothing to do with whether a person is lying or not. It's just the way the person thinks. We also know less smiling too, but again, it's somebody you have to know in order to know how much they smile to begin with to know if they are smiling less than normal. But then there's microexpressions. Microexpressions are things the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, uh, everybody who is going to question a suspect has been trained to look for micro expressions because they are very small patterns of behavior in the face that we can't control. We don't control these. 
And I have a video here that I want to show you of uh, President Clinton lying. So this is President Clinton, and he has been accused of having sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. And this is an interview he has. Watch his eyebrows as he says, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Watch his eyebrows. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Did you see that? Miss Lewinsky. Have sexual relations with that woman. Miss Lewinsky. I have sexual relations with that woman. Miss Lewinsky. <laughs> Anybody trained in micro expressions knows that man is lying and he knows he's lying. Absolutely. And what happened was his, his lawyer told him that the word sexual relations means intercourse. And you did not have intercourse with that woman. So you can say you did not have sexual relations with that woman even though you had oral sex with her. You, so then you don't, you don't have, you can lie without lying use the English language, to lie without, everything I tell you can be 100% true, but not 100% of the truth. Everything I tell you can be 100% truthful, but not 100% of the truth. And so, and he knows he's lying, but he's using the English language to lie about it. And so, uh, anybody who's trained in how to respond or how to see uh, the, the micro expressions know that he's lying. And that is um, micro expressions. Let me go back to our slide presentation. Did you all see his eyebrows go up and down? It's out there on the internet. If you didn't see it, then you can, you can go back to it and see that interview. But it's, it's really obvious, really obvious. <laughs> so uh, do lie detectors really work? That's the machine that hooks you up to a device that reads your sweat and reads your heart rate, reads your blood pressure. So do they really work? And the answer is sort of, sort of. You cannot use a lie detector test in a trial to say that this person is guilty. You only get a person of interest because they fail the lie detector test. They make themselves a person of interest because of the lie detector test, but that does not make them uh, guilty. Because sociopaths can tell you one thing and one second later, the next statement they say is a complete opposite of this, and as far as they're concerned, they didn't lie because sociopaths, whatever comes out of my mouth at the time I, I say it, is the truth. When I say it, it is the truth. It may be one second later and, and opposite of what I said a second ago, but what I said a second ago is the truth, and what I'm saying right now is the truth, and that's a sociopath. So sociopaths cannot, they pass the lie detector test without a problem. And people can be trained to break the lie detector test. And you'd think that, well, nobody can can, you know, control their blood pressure, control their heart rate. Yes, you can control your heart rate, heart rate and your blood pressure. My stepfather was a sniper in Vietnam, four tours of duty, behind the, behind the enemy lines. And when you're a sniper shooting at very long distances, any even a breath and a heartbeat can cause the bullet to go off. So you need to be able to control your everything that you can to get that bullet to get to where it's supposed to go. And he learned to stop his heartbeat. He can stop his heartbeat for a short period of time. And we can stop, we, our heart can stop for a whole four minutes before the oxygen level in our brain starts to deteriorate our brain because we now have too little oxygen in our brain. So four minutes. And he can stop it for like 15 seconds to 30 seconds, which freaks out the nurses because he likes to do that when he's, when he's in the hospital just getting a routine checkup and they're, they're taking his blood pressure and taking his, his heart rate and, 
he just stops his heart rate and they're like, uh, uh, oh no, crash cart, you know, cold blue. And he's like, no, it's, it's okay. <laughs> he freaks them out. So um, if you could do that, you can, you can bust the lie detector. But there's a new lie detector coming down the pike. And it's already been tested. I have a student who's in the military uh, who has actually been tested on this new lie detector. And this new lie detector hooks you up to uh, like an MRI machine and it watches your brain patterns. So it can see the electrical stimulation in your brain. And then let's say there's been a murder at a home at a specific neighborhood and there was a specific gun that was used in that particular murder. And they have a person who is a person of interest. So they take this person in, hook them up to this brain scan, and then they show them pictures of knives and pictures of, of rifles and pictures of bows and arrows and pictures of different types of guns. And one of the different types of guns is the gun that was used in the murder. And their brain doesn't light up, doesn't light up, doesn't light up. Bang, it lights up when they, show, when they see the, the murder weapon. How do you know the murder weapon? <laughs> <laughs> How do you recognize that murder weapon? Well, maybe they own that kind of gun. So person of interest, not necessarily guilty. Then you show them pictures of um, hotels, pictures of giant buildings, pictures of uh, neighborhoods, and a picture of the house where the murder took place. Bang! Their, ha their head lights up because they recognize it. Now you're two for, you know, you got... You're two for, all right, you're a really high person of interest. And the person that was murdered, pictures of people. And the person that was murdered, picture of, bang, their head lights up. Uh, strike three, baby. <laughs> you are a high person of interest. Now, the guy that I know that has actually been tested in this, uh, he said, you can actually break it. And the way to break it is you move your head. Just keep moving your head around. And that breaks it. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're purposely trying to break it, you're a high person of interest simply because you're trying to break your lie detector test. So you are interest. You are the person of interest now because you're trying to break it. So there's there really there's no way to break this. There's you're going to be the high person of interest because you recognize all the different aspects of that particular uh, event that they're trying to work through. So. <laughs> this particular case of murder. So that's the new lie detector tests that are coming down the pike. So emotions are necessary for us, but sometimes they run amok, they get out of control. And um, when this happens, we need to learn how to manage them, to control them. And the reduction of both your emotional feelings and the physiological arousal that anger causes is the goal of anger management. Most people think that anger management means trying to learn not to be angry. No. No. Anger is okay. All emotions are okay. All behavior is not. All emotions are okay. All behavior is not. So in anger management, we're not trying to teach you not to be angry. We're trying to teach you to manage their behaviors for that particular emotion. And what's, what the major problem is for people who get out of control with anger is they do not recognize that they're getting angry. You know when you're getting angry. You feel the physiological arousal. You know this is, uh, I'm pissed off. I'm getting mad. But they don't recognize it. And they get madder and madder and madder until they go into rage. Once you're in rage, you're beyond the ability to think straight, and you're going to do behaviors that are going to get you in trouble with the law. And that's why they go into anger management, to try to teach them to recognize the subtle changes in the body that mean I'm getting angry, I need to turn around and walk away from this situation. So even though we can't get rid of, avoid, or change the things or the people that enrage us, we can learn to control our reactions to them. The most effective way to control the escalation of anger is to stop it before it gets out of control. And to do this means you have to learn how to identify the subtle cues and signs of increasing anger within yourself. 
that's the end of emotion portion. The next part is the motivation portion. Are there any questions about emotion before we move on to motivation? Okay, I'm seeing lots of no's. Lots of no's. All right, let's move on then to the motivation section. So motivation takes a lot of different forms which involve inferred, meaning we can't directly test it, we have to infer a particular type of motivation. And it is physiological and psychological factors and mental processes that select and direct our behavior. Since we cannot measure it directly, it is subjective that we think this person might be motiv motivated, but we don't know for sure why the person is doing what they're doing. How many of you, when you are hungry, you eat? When we're hungry, we eat. <laughs> it's obvious, right? So when we see somebody who's eating, can we infer that they are hungry? No. How many of you eat when you're not hungry? Yeah, lots of us do, right? When we go out with our friends, it's a social event. We eat even though we're not hungry. We're going out because we're sharing time together and we and eating is one of the ways that we share time together and uh, if you're working and it's 12 o'clock and the boss says you have from 12 to 1 to eat lunch and then after that you have to go back to work again well you might get hungry by 2 and be starved by the time you get out of work so you know I'm not hungry at 12 but I'm gonna eat anyway because it's the time to eat Right? So just because we see somebody eating does not mean we can infer that they have the motivation that they're hungry. So you get that? Do you see that? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, and and uh, we'll talk about hunger and eating in this particular unit because motivation to hunger, motivation to eating is a big deal. And some people eat way too much and some people way too little. And we'll see that in this section. So. Yes, we definitely cannot make the assumption that somebody is hungry just because they're eating. So motivation is all the processes involved in starting, directing, and maintaining physical and psychological activities. And we describe motivation as an internal process that causes us to move toward a goal. Toward the goal can be away from something that's unpleasant or toward something that is pleasant. And we use the term motivation to connect what we see in the world with some kind of internal state. So we see somebody eating and we say they must be hungry. But we can't say that. that is, that's not right. Now, maybe we're, the majority of the time we're correct, but not always. Uh, we account for variability in behavior, too. When no, when no other explanation seems appropriate, well, they must have been motivated to do it to explain perseverance despite adversity. Right? We say things like, wow, that, that, he's been told he can't do it, he can't, told, can't do it, and yet he did it anyway. He keeps on pushing, pushing, pushing to try to do it. Well, he's really motivated. There's a story that goes along with this, a true story about a mathematician who won a Nobel Prize. As a student in college, he was in a mathematics class, and he was late to his final exam. Before he got there, the, uh, the instructor wrote a formula on the board and turned around and told the class, this formula is impossible to prove. No one has ever proven this formula. But every single one on your tests is provable, so don't give me any hassle about it. They're all provable. So get to work, and he hands out the test. This guy comes in, and he gets his test, and he sits down and he does his test, and he sees the thing on the board, and he solves it. <laughs> because nobody told him it's impossible. How many times have you been told you can't do that, so you don't even try? Your motivation is reduced to nothing because somebody told you you can't do that. 
but if you had some motivation to do it, you could. And he won a Nobel Prize, not for that particular one, but he did win a Nobel Prize for mathematics. Uh, and that's a true story. So uh, explaining perseverance in spite of adversity. You know, he didn't have adversity. All of his students in the class had been told, and so they didn't try to solve it, and he did. Uh, relating behavior to biology is not considered a motive. People have motives to do things that they learn to do a particular thing. But a drive mechanism is a type of motivation that is related to your biology. So although motivation can be part of a thought process, it does not require conscious effort. There's a lot of times when we are motivated and we don't know why we're motivated. Of course, uh, Freud would have said that we have repressed memories that motivate us. And the drive mechanism and the motive are very different, different. As I just said, drive is a biologically instigated motivation. We'll talk about uh, some animals that have drives that appear to be um, motives to do things, but they're just built-in mechanisms for them. So drive is implemented to reduce physical and psychological needs that are critical to our survival and physical well-being. We eat because we're hungry, but just because we're eating doesn't mean that we are hungry. Uh, so eating can be either a drive or a motive. So the motive is an internal mechanism that directs behavior. It's often used to describe motivations that are learned rather than biologically based. You study for this course, not because there's any biological need to get an A or a B or a C to pass the course, but you have learned that that's what you need to do in order to pass a class, so you're motivated to study. It's not a biological drive mechanism, it's a motive. Incentives are the things that are out there in the world to get you to, to motivate yourself. I cannot motivate you. You motivate yourself to acquire the incentives that are out there in the world. So the incentive is to get to pass the class, right? to get an A, B, or a C. So the incentive is if I want to pass the class, I better study. A carrot on a stick is a way that people describe how to get a horse to, to run, to walk, right? If a, if a horse and buggy are trying to get a horse to go somewhere, then you put a carrot on a stick and hold it out in front of the horse, and the horse will, if it's hungry, go for the stick, supposedly, right? But some, it's a spectrum, and some people, the incentive is not what you think it is, and the horse might not like carrots, and so it might not go for the carrot. So, but the incentive is out there in the world. We put incentives out there for people to go for. And sometimes those incentives are intrinsic that you put into yourself, and some are extrinsic, the things the carrot on the stick that are outside reward areas, right? So intrinsic motivation is a desire to engage in an activity for its own sake without an external reward to motivate you. You have an internal mechanism, an internal reward. I know that there are people in the world who are in this city who are hungry, who do not have enough food, who don't have the money to acquire the food, and so I work for the food bank to help them out. I don't want anybody to recognize me. I don't want a paycheck. I don't want a picture taken and put it in the paper. It's all internal. It's all because I feel I'm doing the right thing by helping somebody by working for the food bank for the less fortunate. It fulfills our beliefs or expectations about ourselves. It's an er internal incentive. External incentives are paychecks. It's a big deal, right? So desire to engage in an activity to achieve an external consequence or reward. We work for the food bank to get a, f a paycheck. Yes, we believe that the food bank is a good organization, but we need money, and so we go and we get hired by the food bank to work for them. It's two different types of incentives, the intrinsic incentive and the extrinsic incentive. Now, unfortunately for politicians, they might have the uh, incentive to work for the food bank. They don't care about being recognized, and yet they will have their picture taken, and we automatically look at them 
negatively saying, oh, they're doing it just because they wanted to get our vote. That's the only reason they're doing it. But again, that's the problem with motivation. We don't know what another person's motivation is. They may truly be a person who wants to help. Conscious motivation is having desire to engage in the activity and actually being aware of it. And unconscious motivation is having a desire to engage in activity but not being aware of it. And that is very close to what uh, Freud said was repressed memories will push you to do certain things and you have no idea why you're doing them unless you uncover that repressed memory and figure out what it is. And then you can consciously do what you were doing before or stop doing what you were doing before. Instinct theory is about the drive mechanisms. These um, are about biological imperatives that certain animals have. It's a view that certain be behaviors are determined by innate biological factors. Swallows returning to Capistrano every year at the same time every year from Argentina. Salmon swimming upstream to spawn in the same place they they their eggs were and they were hatched. Uh, these behaviors are called fixed action patterns and there is, uh, there is some motivation there but it's a built-in motivation of some kind and once they were called instinctual behaviors, these fixed action patterns, but we usually think of an instinct as a reflex action for human beings, instinct. Reflex action is a one single event, re reflex this is a large number of behavior patterns that are associated with these uh, fixed action patterns. I mean, to fly all the way from Argentina back to California and at the Mission Capistrano uh, is just, that's just amazing that they do that every year and then fly back down to Argentina every year and be there within a week of the time that they first one arrives. All of them are there within one week. So it's a genetically based behavior seen across an entire species that can be set off by some specific stimulus in the environment. So what motivates us? Well, the drive theory says that uh, the biological need is what motivates us, an imbalance that threatens survival and produces a particular drive mechanism in the brain. So homeostasis, remember, is the job of the hypothalamus and thalamus, the body's tendency to maintain a biologically balanced condition, the desire to reduce a particular need. And this, um, this does not explain all behaviors, obviously, so drive mechanism, drive theory does not explain how people jump out of airplanes, <laughs> perfectly good airplanes, with a parachute on or white water rafting. The desire to play, um, every single mammal child animal plays. What's that about? You know, so there are people who study play. There are some scientists who study play. And then curiosity. You know, curiosity killed the cat. Uh, but curiosity is something that's built into us. Some, for some reason, we're curious and we have a curious nature. But there's nothing that in drive theory that would recognize some sort of imbalance for curiosity. So none of these behaviors are currently explained through this homeostasis theory. Some drives of like hunger or thirst or sex, some drives are, and motives are more powerful than others. Which ones are more powerful? And that's some really interesting research. And there was a research project that was done many years ago that would not be allowed to be done today because of the damage they did to the animals in this particular experiment. But here's the experiment. These people wanted to find out, is hunger more motivating? Is it a higher drive mechanism than the desire for pleasure? If I put a wire into the center of your brain, into the pleasure center of your brain, and then stimulate the pleasure center of your brain directly. It is the most powerful, pleasurable, pleasurable event you will ever have in your entire life. There is nothing like it to directly stimulate the pleasure center of the brain. So they took rats and they put a wire into the rat's brain. They put a wire into the pleasure center of the rat's brain so they could stimulate the pleasure center directly. 
Then they taught the rat, if they press a bar, they get the stimulation. And the, bar, the rat's like, woo-hoo, <laughs> pressing that bar. Then they, they uh, had other rats that are obviously, they're hungry, and if they press the bar, they can get fed. So they press the bar, they get fed, they press the bar, they get fed. Now they put them in a very large cage that is like 15 feet across. So the rat has a bar on one side of the cage and another bar on the other side of the cage. They have to press this bar on this side of the cage, go over to this bar and press that bar so they can press this bar, get the stimulation in their brain or get some food, go over to this bar, press the stimulation and get some food. So now the rats are running back and forth to get their food or their stimulation. And now the scientists put a big steel grid in the middle with an electric charge on it so that as the rats, they, it's long enough that the rats can't jump over it. They have to cross this electrical grid. And they turn up the electricity a little bit so that the rats are getting a little tingling in their toes. Zoom across there, get, the, get their food. Zoom across, get their food. Turn it up a little bit more. And now they're, they're bouncing a little bit because the, of the electricity that's going through their muscles as they hit those electrical grids. But they bounce across and get to their food, bounce back across and get to their food. They turn it up a little bit more. Now they're bouncing so hard they're hitting the top of the cage. Bounce, 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 bounce as they go across to get to the next side, go back and get to the next side. Turn it up a little bit more. Now, not only are they bouncing up and down because of the electrical stimulation of their muscles, but they're also starting to get burns on their feet. And they're crossing, getting their food, bounce, bounce, bounce back across and get to their food. Turn it up a little bit more. Now, the hair on their feet has burned off. They have no more hair on their feet because of the electricity. As they cross across, bounce across, and get that stimulation on their feet and burn their hair off, they get to the other side, they eat, and they come back to the grid, and they lay down, and they will sit there and starve. They will not cross that, black, that grid again. They go back to see if they can get the food from this one. No, nope. and they will not cross the electric grid. The rats that are getting the electrical stimulation in their brain, same exact thing, but where the rats that were getting fed stop, the rats that have the electrical stimulation are crossing that grid, getting burned, going all the way across, getting again, coming back across, getting again, and they turn it up a little bit more, and now their, their skin is really being ripped up by the electricity. In fact, they turn it up so much that by the time when they hit the electrical grid, they die from electrocution, and they're still trying to get across the grid to get to that stimulation. Pleasure is way more powerful than hunger. And yet, that cannot be associated with sex. I'm sorry, but that's what they said, was sex is more drive powerful than, than hunger is. But no, it was the direct stimulation of the, of the pleasure center of the brain. And yeah, that's going to be really powerful as compared to a direct stimulation of your um, hyper, we'll talk about it in just a minute, the connection of, get, of being hungry. Right? So, because we know exactly where it is that we get stimulated in our brain to say we're hungry and eat. So it's an interesting, very interesting experiment, could never be done today because of what they did to the animals. That is not acceptable. Uh, we have now the independent review boards, our institutional review boards, that say, no, you can't treat an animal that way. You're going to have to find a different method of proving that, um, that the direct stimulation of the brain is uh, more powerful than hunger. Right? Do you get that experiment? Do you see how it, was work how it worked? seeing some yeses. Good, yes, yes, yes. All right. So social learning theory is two important aspects of motivation include the expectation of achievement and the value of the goal. We don't go after lost causes. If we think that something can't be done, we just, we won't do it. It's a lost cause. You ever heard that saying, lost cause?
some of you haven't. Uh, a, a lost cause means, well, there's no purpose in doing it. That's what happened to those, those math students. They were told it's a lost cause. They did not even try. But the other guy hadn't been told, so he went ahead and he solved it. There are 30-story um, and more buildings in the world, and some of them have flat roofs. Right? And New York, big time, lots of 30-story buildings and, and higher. Now, there's not really 30-story buildings around here. Have any of you ever been to a city where there are 30-story buildings? Some of you have. Okay. New York. Some of you have been to New York. Very good. Uh, I've been to lots of cities that have them in my lifetime. So let's put a – if you're in a 30-story building and you have to get to the building across, so you're in this building and you have to get to the other building, you go down the elevator, across, the, the back up again to the other building. What if I just put a giant steel beam across their 30-story buildings so you could just walk across to the other, other building? If you're up on the top floor of this building, just go up one floor to the, to the roof and walk across it to the other side. All right? Let's say there's no wind. The steel beam is soldered in, so it's not going to move, and it's really wide, so you can walk across it. How many of you would walk across a steel building beam 30 stories up in the, in the air, across a, a sidewalk, across four lanes of traffic, across another sidewalk to get to the other one? Would any of you do that? Not me, Morgan says. <laughs> will not work. So here's a person afraid of heights, Lisa, very good. <laughs> Just, oh, my God, yeah. Okay, so no's, lots of no's. What if I paid you $10,000? How many of you would change your mind? Would anyone change your mind for $10,000? Some of you would change your mind for, for $10,000, but some of you would not. No, yes, Lisa, no, I, no. Uh, okay, Lee, where do I sign? Uh, uh, Kiana, maybe, that's a good answer. Maybe, possibly, right? Okay, what if your child is on the other side and is walking toward the, and is going to fall off? Would you run across it then to save your child? If you say no, please don't have any. Children, if you say no, don't have any children, right? Yeah, the value of the goal has gotten so large that you will do it. All oh, bets are off. I'm already across it, Lisa. Very good. <laughs> yeah, because the value of the goal. I have a, a this is a, a made up situation, but um, let's say I'm in high school and um, I'm a beauty level five, and I don't expect the 10 beauty queen of the school to ever go out with me, but I'd love to ask her out, but you know, that's a lost cause. Uh, she's not going to go out with me because tens don't go out with fives. So I don't even ask, but she's an only child and her father's a billionaire. I might as well ask, just, I could prove to her that I'm a worthy person. I may not be pretty, but I will take good care of her. I will love her. I will work hard to make sure our family is. But she doesn't know that until she gets to know me, so I have to ask her out, right? So all, all bets are off, right? I'm going to ask her out because she may end up being an only child that, that ends up with a billion dollars when her parents pass away. So that is a, a made-up situation. But there are lots of people out there that are like that. Uh, the locus of control is an individual's belief in their ability to control outcomes. Again, this is something that is related to your culture, and this is something that you could talk about in your, in your paper about the differences between cultures and societies at the end of the uh, class, at the end of the semester. So the internal is a control rests with the individual. External control rests with something outside the individual. And I can tell you a true story about this one. I played baseball, and I could not hit a home run. I'm, it, it's impossible. I just I trained and trained and trained and to practice and practice. I cannot hit a home run. There was a guy on our team. You could put one hand behind his back, holding the bat with one hand. He could knock him over the fence every single time. I was like, how do you do that? I tried. I could hit. I, it was easy to hit the ball. I could hit the ball. I got. I was. I had the highest batting average in the in. At, in the games, um, 
but and I could hit singles and, and doubles, and I was a really fast runner, so I could actually make my doubles into triples easily, but I couldn't make an in-the-park home run. I just couldn't get it, and I couldn't do an out-of-the-park home run, certainly. Well, if at any time I had ever hit a home run, I never did, but if I ever hit a home run, there are two ways I could look at it. One is, yeah, I can do it. I finally have the ability. It's internal. I practiced and practiced and practiced, and now I can hit a home run. It's internal. The other way to look at it is, man, the wind was blowing in the right direction for that one because that's, that's the only reason I could hit a home run is if something external allowed me to hit the home run, right? So the, the ball was taken over the fence by the wind, not by me. Right? That's an external locus of control. And this is related to your culture because in China, you're told how many children you're allowed to have. You're told what kind of job you're going to have. You're told where you're going to go to school. There's a whole host of things. The government controls your life in China. So everyone in China is basically set in an external control, locus of control. Whereas here in the United States, we're internal locus of control. We're individualistic society. You do it because you are the person who is in charge of your life. So that's locus of control, also a part of motivation. We have uh, ha uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And um, I have notice here that part pyramid does not have a top on it. It's been cut off because I want to talk about that top also. But the hierarchy of needs, according to Maslow, is that we are motivated to do particular things based on this hierarchy of needs. The first thing we're motivated to do is get our biological needs taken care of, the drive mechanisms. So the need for food, water, oxygen, rest, sexual expression, and release from tension. The next one is safety, needs for security and comfort, tranquility, fear, freedom from fear, not having any fear. The next one is attachment. This is an interesting one because it has the need to belong to a group, to affiliate, to be loved, and to love. And you know that a man made this because sex is on the very bottom and attachment is in the middle. And if a woman had made this, sex and attachment and love are together for women. Men separate them. Women do not separate them on the normal distribution scale. The majority of women are very different than the majority of men, the way they look at this. Esteem is the need for confidence, uh, sense of self-worth and, and competence in doing things, self-esteem and respect of other people. And self-actualization is the need to fulfill potential, have a meaningful goals in life. And then there's the upper part, the top part. So this is where self-actualization is where Maslow ended, but Rogers, Carl Rogers, added to it. And Maslow's ending for this is absolutely Donald Trump fits this. He is, self, he is fully self-actualized. He's met all his biological needs, all his safety needs. He is attached to certain people. He has self-esteem out the yin-yang, and he is very self-actualized, very self-actualized. So he is a self-actualized person according to Maslow. But according to Carl Rogers, the top part is called a fully functioning person. And the, by that definition, fully functioning, by the definition of fully functioning, Trump does not fit that. Because according to, self, according to Carl Rogers, what he meant by fully functioning is he is congruent with reality. He knows what goes on in, around him, and he, what he believes goes on around him actually does go on around him and Donald Trump is, does not fit that. Um, he believes he's the best possible uh, husband ever, and I've been using this, by the way, for 15 years because, and this is the reason I'm using it, because he was cheating on his first wife with his second wife. He actually had his um, second wife build in, in, a Trump, in the Trump Towers a beautiful co convention center where he got married to his third wife in the, in the building and in the convention area that his second wife made for him. That is not a fully functioning person when he says, I'm the best husband ever. No, you're not. You do not understand uh, what being a good husband means. 
So that means he's not fully functioning according to the definition by Carl Rogers. He is certainly fully functioning human being, but not according to the definition by Carl Rogers. Uh, there is a, we talked about intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation. My own belief that I need to do things for myself to, to prove that I am a good person. Right? Uh, and the reason I do things because I'm just, I, I just have this need to do it. Like for, I'm into ham radio and I just, it's just a cool thing to do. It's just neat to, to do ham radio. Um, I'm Jewish too, so I'm a Jewish ham. <laughs> uh, but over justification is kind of an interesting aspect to motivation where we have a internal desire to do something and it is completely destroyed by an external motive, an external reward. And this happens all the time in our jobs and in school. We start off school as elementary school kids, and most of us love going to school. We're meeting our friends. We're having a great time. We're learning new things. We're having a, it's just a lot of fun in first grade. And now some of us, this, this is spectrum again, some of us are crying because we are being separated from our parents for the first time, our mom for the first time, or our dad for the first time. And um, so we're not very happy going to school at first, but we eventually get to enjoy school. And it's an internal thing. It's like, let's go to school. I want to go to school. I want to go to school because I'm going to meet all my friends. I'm going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to learn new things. And we tend to hopefully enjoy learning. But that internal motivation to learn, to learn something, that's the reason I'm going to school is to learn something becomes I have to get an A, I have to get a B, I have to get past the class with a C, right? I can't get an F. I need the little stars on the board, the little gold stars that we put up on the front board so that we can um, get our extra time at, at recess or don't have to do a specific piece of homework. And we lose the internal thing that says, I love to learn. And instead, we're doing it for a different purpose altogether, to get the reward. And this happens in jobs as well. We finally get a job where we're absolutely, we, we love the job. We enjoy doing what it is that we're doing because it's, it's a great company. It, it, hopefully you all end up with something like that. All, some of us end up just getting whatever we can. But you, if you get a good job, really nice job, you get flow in the job too. We'll talk about flow where you're at just happy and time just slips by, all of a sudden you're, you're, you go to work and the next thing you know, it's over. It's like, darn, you know, <laughs> I want to work some more. You really enjoy what you're doing. And within five years, you're seeing other people getting raises that for the work that you did, they're getting promotions because they're your boss and you're the one who did the work for it. You should be getting a promotion. You're the one who did the work. And you're, and you're just, you want the external reward and you forget completely. The, the internal mechanism has been destroyed by the, ex, by the external. The internal has been destroyed by the external. And it's a sad, it's sad that that happens. But recognize that it can happen and maybe you'll be able to break that pattern when you get a really, really good job at a, company you feel is just an excellent company. So this is the story of the Italian immigrant. I don't think this is a true story, but it's a great, I found it and I thought it was just perfect for this particular situation. Uh, an Italian immigrant comes to the United States, can't speak very good English, gets a ground floor apartment in an apartment complex and plays his opera inside his apartment complex all day long. The children in the neighborhood are like, this is disgusting music. Let's Let's mess with this guy. Let's take our boom box. He's on the first floor. We can sit outside his window and play our boom boxes, you know, our rap music and other stuff as, as loud as we can and, and just disturb this guy because he's just weird. And so they play as they, then he goes out and tries to get him away. He, um, he calls 
the manager, you know, of the rent of the place and come get these children out of here. Now, well, I mean, they're allowed to be there, you know, I can't get them away. Um, so he, if he, if it wasn't an apartment complex, he could call the cops, you know, and have them chased away. Um, cause you can't just, you know, sit on the sidewalk, but he, he can't get them to go away. So one day he walks out and they're like, what you going to do? And he's got a handful of dollar bills. He's like, I like your music. You've been playing it for so long. I really like your music. I want you to play it every day. And I'll pay you to play it every day. I will pay you one dollar, every one of you. You get a dollar for playing. Come on in, and I'll give you a dollar for playing your music. In fact, have all your friends come. I'll play. I will give them a dollar, too. And I have Pepsi, and I have Mountain Dew. If you want a Pepsi or Mountain Dew, I got plenty of them. I'll give you Pepsi and Mountain Dew, too, so you can sit out here. It might be a hot day, but I'll open my windows up so I can listen to you play your music, and I'll be able to listen to them. So every day for a week, they get their Pepsi, they get their Mountain Dew, they get their dollar, they come back every day. The next day, he's like, the next week, he's like, I'm, I'm out of Pepsi and Mountain Dews, but I'm still going to pay you a dollar. I'm going to pay you a dollar. So the, come on back, I'm giving you a dollar. So they come back that week. The next week, he's like, I'm running out of money, but I still pay you, I'll, I'll pay you. I'll give you 10 cents each to come back. We're not gonna do this for 10 cents, and they leave. So within three weeks, he's cleared them out because he changed their incentive from internal to external, and then he took away the external. <laughs> and they had forgotten all about and destroyed the internal. Do you get that? <laughs> Do you get that? Well, and like I said, unfortunately, that's what happens to us in jobs. That's, that's exactly what happens to us in our jobs. We, we are destroyed by this external reward, the paycheck, the bonuses, the promotions are destroying our internal, re, internal mechanism, which is like, I want to work for this company because they do good in the world. And I can do good in the world for, for the world by working for this company. And within five years, you've, you've got, you're destroyed. So that is um, over justification, it's called over justification. And I think I'm gonna stop right here and I will pick this up again when we come back on Thursday. So if there are any questions, Please stay and talk to me. If not, uh, make sure that you put your name into the chat bar that said you're here, and uh, then you're all free to go. Have a good Wednesday. I'll talk to you on Thursday. Bye. Stay healthy.